Okay, we're gonna start. Good morning to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Simone Schneider, um, a tenure track professor in the, our department. She has been with us now almost a year and a half. Uh, she got her PhD uh, in, from the University of Humboldt in Berlin. Um, then she went to Dublin, I think, to Trinity College for a postdoc position for a, a couple of years. Uh, she moved back to Germany to Munich for a senior position, research position at the Max Planck uh, Institute um, for social law and social policy. Her work lies in the intersection between political sociology, um, uh, social psychology, and comparative uh, studies. She has published ex extensively on these issues in top journals in Europe and the international. And um, the work is mostly on the intersection. Her topics uh, of interest are the intersection um, or the legitimisa le legitimation and reproduction of social inequalities and how people perceive them and how these perceptions may change uh, according to the social context. She's now currently leading a project, an ERC uh, starting grant project, uh, 1.5 million uh, euros, not bad. And uh, on misperception, this is the, the title, uh, misperception of economic inequality, the impact of welfare state institutions on social perception and preference formation. Uh, and she will be presenting today uh, the project and some preliminary uh, results, I, I guess. Uh, so thank you very much. Again, a pleasure, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jorge, for the kind introductory words, and thank you, Veronica, for inviting me to this uh, research forum. Um, Yes, uh, this title of today's presentation is a shortened version of the title that I chose for, for the ERC project. And uh, I think I, on a slightly disappointing note for today, I uh, have to say that you might not leave this room with a satisfying answer to the question of why institutions matter or if institutions matter for the misperception of economic inequality. Instead, indeed, I want to... Uh, introduce the project itself, the overall idea of the project, the research questions, the underlying research design and concepts, as well as to, in a second step, borrow from uh, previous work that uh, I've done in this area to underline the main argument um, and also to give you a better idea of what I'm doing. And if then there is a bit of time left, um, I will introduce uh, some very preliminary findings um, that we did on the side uh, for this project. Um, so what is the project about? Um, uh, the Paragap wants to basically circle in on the, the, the relationship between institutions and perceptions. And it tries to shed more light on the complexity of social cognitions Right? And it wants to better understand how institutions shape our understanding and interpretation of inequalities. Yeah. I will, as I said, borrow from, first I want to introduce the project, but then I will borrow also from my earlier work on this topic to underline the main assumption here. But let's rewind a bit. So when we talk about inequalities, in particular about economic inequalities, there are two big questions that uh, become apparent. Uh, the question of who gets what and why, and who should get what and why. And of course, I'm not the first one to ask these questions, but I argue that in the current times and observing such dramatic changes economically, so, so, socially, demographically, as well as politically, um, it becomes even more pressing to find answers to these questions. However, as scholars, it does matter what approach we take, what perspective we can choose, what we want to focus on, and the answers, of course, to these questions will depend uh, on, the, on the perspective. And Paragap chooses what I call here an institutional approach, 
as well as a perceptual approach. Yeah? When, when I talk about an institutional perspective, it's mainly focusing on state actors, the role of government, and in how far um, the government chooses to distribute as well as redistribute economic resources. And by, by taking action, so to say, it signals, it brings about normative signals to the question of who should get what and why. On the other hand, uh, what I understand as a perceptual approach, it's quite straightforward in a way that it chooses the individual, right? It chooses us in the room and it presumes that every one of us has a particular answer to the question of who gets what and why and who should get and what and why. So it borrows here um, not from the social policy literature as the institutional one, but from more from the sociological as well as from the uh, social psychology uh, literature. And basically assumes that more or less we can articulate our perceptions in a way and we can give answers to these two questions. So how are these two interconnected? Well, what we already heard in the previous talk in this research forum, perceptions of inequality are at the forefront right, of uh, current debate. Um, they guide our behavior. They provoke emotional responses. Factors that are essential for uh, the society, for the societal welfare, as well as the stability of societies. But why do we want now to bring in institutions into the picture? And what I argue here is that social disparities are imprinted in the legal frameworks of social security systems. And that these systems do not only protect us from social risks, but they also provide distinct answers to the question of who gets what and why and who should get what and why, right? And as we live in these structures, yeah, as we are growing up, these institutions shape our understanding of society and we can use them as scripts as to interpret the social world around us. Yeah? So in short, institutions matter, this is an argument here, and they define what we think. Of course, here I borrowed from the sociological debate, drawing on Coleman's model, we can also easily transfer that to make it more approachable for political scientists here in the room, um, who basically chose a circular model, um, uh, focusing here on social policies as well as um, public opinion, and they termed it the policy feedback effect on how social policies basically shape the public's opinion. But the story remains the same. So in a nutshell, and to summarize the three key arguments, it is first that welfare state institutions act as stratifying actors. Um, I'm not the first one to, uh, to, to say that. Uh, uh, for example, Josta already pointed that out and others. Um, however, um, I believe that we have to do more research on that. And to emphasize the point that social security systems do not only protect us, but they also manifest and enforce social inequalities in society. Second, I make a point here that institutions endow meaning, um, and they may determine, I mean, I, we still need to, to find that out, how we perceive and justify economic inequalities in society. I'm still puzzled by the fact that there are not um, enough measurement tools out there to actually study and analyze this link. Yeah. What we see in the literature is that most of the, the, the measurements, the empirical measures, um, focus on the generosity of a system. They focus on the coverage um, of a system. However, and here the project makes a point that um, it argues that we need new measurements that try to assess um, the gradual differences between countries when it comes to the terms what I coined the institutional imprints of social disparities. Against this background, the project poses two um, essential research questions. Um, the first one 
um, is how do systems differ in their conceptions of social inequality as it is imprinted in their legal framework? And how can we assess and quantify these differences empirically? And secondly, we want to understand in how far these institutions and systems um, can explain to some extent why there are systematic differences in the perception and preference formation um, in societies and why they differ systematically between societies but also between groups within societies. The research design um, is interdisciplinary and quite ambitious. It brings together various disciplines and it lies and is located at the intersection of social law and social policy on the one hand, as well as sociology and social psychology on the other hand. And uh, the design is, uh, is chosen here to be a large country comparative one. It includes um, 50 countries at three time points and what we want to do as a team, we want to collect, systematize and quantify information on legal regulations um, uh, with an emphasis being drawn on healthcare, old age security, um, as well as minimum protection and unemployment. And in a second step, we will combine these new indicators with data from large scale um, and comparative survey data, mainly focusing in uh, on, on the ESS, the European Social Survey, as well as the ISSP um, study to analyze empirically the link between uh, these, what I call the institutional imprints of social inequalities as well as perceptions and preference formations. So I believe that the output is of global impact if we are successful. <laughs> um, we are currently working to design uh, uh, theoretically and conceptual framework that is not only interdisciplinary but also inclusive. Second, we hope to um, come up with a unique novel data set um, which includes macro-level indicators, um, including novel measurement instruments of what I just defined as institutional imprints. And that can not only be used by us as a team, but is actually available for the larger research community to study the consequences of, um, of, of social policies and institutional frameworks, as well as the um, causes here. What we want to do, thirdly, to advance knowledge, to actually create new knowledge on the societal forces that shape our perceptions and preference formation processes, to make also prediction on the emotional reaction and behavioral responses that people make. And also, hopefully, to find um, out more about the potential self-legitimizing mechanisms that have been voiced in the political science literature. As a fourth point is that we believe that it's also important to establish a platform, which we call the inequality hub, um, that brings researchers from the dis different disciplines together that work on this, um, um, on this, uh, in this field. Um, it is quite interdisciplinary. Uh, when you have a look at the literature, economists, political scientists, psychologists and sociologists are very uh, curious to study and find um, more out about the systematic variations in perceptions, but also in the institutional frameworks. I'm not doing this work by myself, and uh, three of my team members are already sitting here in the front row, and I'm very happy to have them on the team. May is based uh, in, uh, at the Max Planck Institute, as this project will be carried out in col uh, collaboration with the Max Planck in, in Munich. So how did I come up with this? Um, with this uh, kind of a project idea, but also um, I want to use that to refer to my previous research to uh, highlight a few points, an assumption that I made and to make it more explicit to you what we are studying. Um, so early on in my academic career, I was already um, interested in studying perceptions of inequality um, and justice. 
and I was involved in various research projects. And what it comes apparent, and you might have wondered already at this point, how I define perceptions of inequality, right? Especially from a psychological perspective. Um, I use it here, or I use it so far as an umbrella term that embraces various concepts. And we clearly have to distinguish between some of them um, as we go along and study perception. So uh, when it comes to the object of our perception, we have clearly dis distinguished between the outcomes of a distributive pr uh, process as well as its underlying principles. We also have to be aware on whether we study a perception of the status quo or a preference um, about what we want to happen. Um, as well as more global um, belief systems that shape also our perceptions and preferences. But we are not only actually focusing on these non-reflexive con concepts, so regarding the other society, but also about reflexive ones. So um, thinking about the observer, like ourselves, and what we think about ourselves. Right, in terms of inequalities and principles and what we have in comparison to others. So here I just want to make a point and barring on, for example, what has been highlighted and studied as subjective social status as an example for a reflexive concept looking into the outcome and being more on a perception side here. And I wanted to focus on it because it was also mentioned in the previous talk here in the research forum. And I use this particular indicator to understand the link between economic inequalities at a country level and life satisfaction um, uh, measures. Um, However, I don't want to really go into, into what I particularly did, but um, I want to highlight this as one of the examples, and I want to address that we do find systematic differences when it comes to this indicator, which as in, in the survey here, I used the ESS survey from 2012, there are people who tend to be towards the top of our society and people who tend to be towards the bottom. On this card, there's a scale that runs from top to bottom. Where would you place yourself on the scale nowadays? So here, it shows a graph. And again, I want to underline the systematic differences that become apparent. And what you see on the x-axis is the income, household income, and on the y-axis, the averages of the, um, like the mean values of subjective social status. What is not very surprising is that when you have more income, you're also perceived to be higher up in society yourself. However, what is fascinating still to me and puzzling is the fact that when we discriminate between different countries and the size and the level of economic inequality that we can observe, that we find throughout all income groups that individuals who live in more equal societies place themselves on average higher up on this social ladder than people who are living in more unequal societies. They tend, across all income groups, to rate themselves lower on this scale. Another indicator I want to present here when it comes to non-reflexive um, concepts, also again looking at the outcome, um, are um, um, uh, questions on earnings. Earnings um, related to high status groups and low status groups. And um, in different questionnaires, people are asked what um, you think as a respondent, a chairman, or a managing director of a large corporation earns, or an unskilled worker. Sometimes there are more um, other gradual differences being made regarding the occupation. Um, this is on the perception side, and we can put these two in comparison to each other to find out more about the gap. There's another question then usually addressing what is a just and fair average income. And when we set the two in comparison, we can also kind of assess what is the preferred earnings gap in society. Yeah. And 
again, when we put these two gaps together, we actually find out more about the legitimacy of a state. Here, I um, only focus here on, on Germany. This is another graph from another publication. Um, which puts these two together with, with life satisfaction. However, again, I want to address that there are systematic differences, again, across household income groups. Here I use the equivalence, household income. And what is not very surprising is that people usually perceive higher earning gaps than they want, that they perceive as fair, right? This is not very surprising. It's also not surprising that in general, higher income groups prefer or see higher earning gaps as more fair, right, than lower income groups. What is interesting, however, when it comes to the comparison of what these different income groups perceive, and what we see is that lower income groups perceive a lower disparity in society between incomes of managers and workers, but of course, they also prefer a lower gap um, than higher income groups. And when you look at the perception of the lowest income group of the gap, it kind of equals the preferred gap of the highest income group. Yeah. Now there's somebody <laughs> who needs to silent their microphone. Um, on another side, and actually now looking at the gap, at the gap between these two, so bringing them together. We, uh, a colleague of mine, Juan Carlos Castillo and I, we were looking into the fact and we wanted to understand in how far poverty attributions actually happen to explain the discrepancy, so what we termed the perceived justice in income inequality circling in more on the fact that these attributions allow us to measure belief systems. Yeah, we did find, indeed, that internal attributions that relate poverty more to internal causes, like effort or lack of effort in this, this regard, while um, external uh, attributions that refer to economic circumstances, unequal opportunities, um, discrimination, um, that external ones actually uh, lead people to think that uh, justice or the justice gap is more unjust, actually, that the gap is wider between what they perceive and what they prefer, while internal ones, of course, are more legitimizing in this sense. However, what is important, and that's why I want to bring it here, uh, are two facts. Here, I just show the factor scores of poverty attribution, internal and external ones, across Eastern and Western Germany. Um, we compared these two, uh, two regions here, and our arguments on belief systems mainly circled around the fact of Western Germany as inducing or incorporating meritocratic beliefs. Yeah. And what we um, presume also from the literature is that we have to distinguish between uh, dominant belief systems, or primary beliefs, and secondary challenging beliefs. So primary beliefs are more established in a culture, right? and therefore they should also show less variation. And this is what we see for Western Germany. However, when it comes to challenging beliefs, they should vary much more, and also are more strongly tied to structural factors of the individual. And this is exactly also what we found later on um, running our models. Yeah. And in contrast to that, as a Easter, um, as, as a having a, a different uh, history, um, Eastern Europe doesn't show these, um, these variations. So to sum up this book, um, and to highlight a few things is that we, when we talk about perceptions of inequality, I refer to various concepts and we have to distinguish these concepts because they also relate to a different theoretical reasoning. Um, when we borrow from, for example, psycholo uh, psychology as well as sociology. Um, 
they also vary systematically, not only across societies, but also between groups within societies. And actually, this is what we are going to study in the project, these systematic differences. Another key uh, finding that was actually more like a pre-study um, of, of our work was work on the perceived unfairness in healthcare. Unfortunately, you don't see now, except, yes, I will. Thank you. Now you do. And this is joint work with Ellen Immergut. And Ellen Immergut being an expert on uh, neo-institutionalist theory and me coming from the empirical justice literature, we wanted to understand why there is such variation in answers to the question that were posed in the ISSP study on healthcare related to the perceived unfairness in healthcare. And people were asked here, is it fair or unfair that people with high incomes can afford better healthcare than people with lower incomes on a scale from one to five? And what we presumed here is um, that coming from or drawing from empirical justice theory, that there are existential standards. So the status quo determines what we or how we respond to this question. While coming from also from neo-institutional theory, we highlight that the power of institutions, the normative power, and we formulated two hypotheses that go quite against the normal intuition, right? In, Intuitively, I would have thought that, of course, if there are higher disparities in healthcare, right, that there is a greater need for equalizing it, and that would, people would find it more unfair. Right? However, and stemming from these two theories, we actually uh, presume that it's the status quo that shapes our preferences, right, and how, we, how unfair we perceive it. And we post that the higher the structural barriers to healthcare access, assuming that there are also structurated economic inequalities related um, to, to healthcare, the less that respondents perceive unequal healthcare as being unfair. On the second note, the greater the level of public financing for healthcare, the more that respondents perceive unequal healthcare as unfair. And this is exactly what we found. I mean, I just present here, again, uh, uh, descriptive findings, but of course we tested that with multi-level analysis. Um, however, I have to mention that it's cross-sectional data, right? Always cross-sectional here. Um, we can discuss that later. Um, however, this is what we found. So a negative relationship between cost barriers and perceived unfairness going exactly in the direction of what we presumed and drawing upon the theory. The same goes for public health expenditure, right? The higher the public health expenditure, the higher the perceived unfairness of these inequalities. So these are the main highlights, and this study kind of uh, served as a pre-study for me when I draw up this, the, the project, um, because it made me curious, right? Why and how institutions matter? And we even uh, found out also uh, drawing on interaction effects between uh, spending on, on income groups that the public financing is even more important for unfairness attitudes of lower income groups, and we concluded Though, of course, with the limitation that we only have cross-sectional data here at hand, that this may be evidence for institutional generated norms of equal health care rights. <clears throat> but, of course, um, here, when we, when we um, already started this study and came up with this idea, we were quite... Um, we were quite unsatisfied with the indicators that were available for studying the structural inequalities in healthcare systems. Although we were working um, at that time also in a large research group that was mainly tackling differences in health systems across Europe. Later on in my academic career, I was, um, as Jorge pointed out, at the Max Planck Institute, and I was leading a, 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 a project on old age security, 
And instead of studying the relationship between uh, social, um, <clears throat> between uh, uh, pensions, pension systems, and public opinion, what we try to do is here to visualize um, old age security systems, actually the interplay of the different um, institutions and the different schemes. And I want to make here, of course, a bit of advertisement. Um, um, as it was a lot of work, we not only came up with colorful pictures, but we actually um, also collected a lot of inf uh, legal information on each of these schemes. Um, and what you see here, and actually I don't want to get into the complexity here on old age security systems, but what you see on the x-axis is mainly uh, the, the working age population, similarly the coverage, the y-axis, the level of protection, um, as well as uh, distinguishing between minimum, standard and uh, protection as well as topping up function. What you have to understand while I now click through these slides is that basically red emphasizes state state uh, schemes. The yellow parts um, uh, illustrate occupational schemes and the blue parts are private pension schemes. And I just used here Great Britain because it's just so intuitive and very easy and simple compared to other systems. Well, here in Great Britain, you see that the new state pension, like a state scheme, is quite equal in power um, as to when it comes to the providing a standard level of protection in Great Britain um, compared to occupational pension schemes that are based on a totally different financing logic. Um, it's actually quite similar to Ireland. This is not so surprising. Of course, it's also not surprising that the French system is quite different from what has been termed the more liberal um, systems. We have the, a highly fragmented old age security system here in France um, that fragments uh, particular groups um, um, from a state perspective into different uh, schemes. Um, being another continental country here, Germany, um, um, of course, is also the Bismarckian state. However, it is still fragmented, but less fragmented as France. So we do observe differences, of course, um, already um, across states that are usually um, often referred to to have similar characteristics. Norway is quite different, of course, as uh, being a, a, a representing a Nordic state. However, we also perceived um, and also found large differences in the institutional interplay between Nordic countries. So this is Norway. Sweden is already a bit different um, when you look into the power of, uh, of the occupational uh, schemes. When it comes to Denmark, it's uh, very different. Um, and Finland uh, uh, composes uh, a different uh, system or structure. Um, when it comes to old age security. Italy, as a southern Mediterranean state, is highly fragmented um, and is different to Spain, who, which is also fragmented, but in, to a different degree. When we look into Eastern Europe, it becomes even, these disparities become even more um, 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 visual. Uh, uh, here, the Slovenian case, just as a attractive case of a very simple um, case, uh, mainly drawing from one scheme, from a statutory uh, pension scheme. However, comparing it to Estonia, you see here that uh, the World Bank actually <laughs> had a big impact here on the Estonian um, old age security system and um, uh, contributions um, are not only flowing into the statutory scheme, but also into the, what is called the mandatory funded pension. Although, of course, I have to highlight here, there's a reversal effect going on in these Eastern European countries that mainly introduce such, a, 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 such important private funds for establishing um, old age security. Of course, we can also look outside of Europe, and here is an example of China, um, again, quite different, especially in terms of coverage, as well as Brazil, having some kind of uh, fragmentation, but also the coverage is um, different. So what are the main highlights here? And what I wanted to emphasize here 
is um, the idea that it's not only the level of coverage and the level of generosity, but it's also the level of fragmentations between, for example, when it comes to state schemes that matters, that there are different financing modes um, coming into play, that there are different redistributive logic and other stratifying elements when it comes to old age security, and that this may lead to what can be termed as institutional generated norms of unequal pension rights and uh, formation or reformation as these systems um, change uh, uh, of solidarities. How much time do I have left? Okay. 30 minutes, 10 minutes? I'm so good in time. Um, actually, then I have a bit of room for presenting a bit of ongoing research, so it's not the end yet. Um, so while uh, coming up and drawing on a theoretical framework um, and a conceptual framework for collecting legal information and to studying then uh, empirically these institutional imprints, um, I came up with an idea last, last year to, to uh, keep ourselves busy, basically, um, to study, and this might uh, look quite familiar for those who have looked into the indicators for preferences for redistribution um, that are quite commonly used also in the political science literature, right? And here we draw on the ESS um, uh, survey, and this is an example of a non-reflexive um, uh, measure, outcome-related, um, but more um, capturing a preference uh, with regard to when it comes to government intervention. So um, individual respondents have been asked, um, the government should take measures to reduce differences in income levels as an item, and they could disagree or, uh, strongly or agree strongly or something in between when they chose to. And um, the, what it appears that differences in this indicator, um, th that there is variation, and the question is now, is there variation that is uh, systematically induced? And the main question here, um, what I posed in this paper is, do particular institutional characteristics shape the public's preferences for redistribution? Um, of course, there's a bunch of literature out there when it comes to this measurement. And it's such an easy measure to use, and it's also available not only in the ESS, but also across country comparative survey studies. But it mainly focuses, um, when it comes to economic inequalities, on the Gini coefficient, for example. And what has been found is that the higher the economic inequality, mostly, um, using at the disposable, uh, the Gini based on the disposable income, um, the higher the demand for redistribution, following up on a need argument, um, so to say. Um, what I termed here a contextual argument, because here I don't want to focus only on the actual economic inequality, but on the degree of state intervention by looking into the Gini or taking the Gini based on the market income, household income, and its difference to the Gini based on the disposable household income. Yeah? And what I argued here, in following up on this contextual argument, going one-to-one -one together with the economic inequality argument, that the lower the state intervention, the higher the demand for redistribution. Assuming that the lower the state intervention, the higher the economic inequalities, and thus, when the two go together, <coughs> the demand um, uh, for, for redistribution um, is, is uh, influenced. The institutional argument makes a different point uh, and follows up what I just said previously. And um, here, the argument goes that the higher the state intervention, in the, the redistributive effort, it has a signaling effect and it draws and not only on the support of the public, but it also creates support for redistribution. So here we would assume that the welfare state redistribution increases that demand for redistribution. However, of course it comes 
uh, along with the question of endogeneity and causality. Yeah. Um, and that's why here um, I draw, uh, I tried to make a longitudinal perspective, um, drawing on the several rounds of the European Social Survey. But of course, that said, can I really be sure that I, I empirically test causality? No, right? Um, it's mainly barred or drawn on theoretical assumption. But by taking a longitudinal perspective, at least, um, we can see in how far changes in the institutional context go along with changes in preferences. And another here approach to the question how to deal with causality and the socializing effects of institutions that we presume is to look at the foreign-born population. And I've done that before in an earlier paper where I studied healthcare institutions and public um, evaluations of healthcare systems and the results were actually quite surprising for myself that we do see systematic differences. And the main arguments here is that here I look at respondents that have not been socialized in the institutional system, right? That they have not been growing up in the country and that they have some kind of an outsider perspective that they bring in and that they draw on knowledge and experience from alternative arrangements, yeah? So they have what I call the a dual frame of reference. So they are not only experiencing the system as it is right now, but they are also have the experience and knowledge of another, at least one other setting. Yeah. So empirically, what we can do applying a three level analysis is to study the effects of the actual institutional design of the country of residence and the effect of the change the discrepancy, the uh, dissimilarity of the institutional setting between the country of origin as well as the country of residence. And of course, this is also another aspect that comes along when studying the foreign born. We know how long they have been living in the country of residence and we can study in how far there are systematic differences between countries and the length of residence in the country. Here, um, I look at the ESS 2002 to 2020, pooling the sample for all years. Again, first I look at the overall sample, and then I only look at EU migrants, EU foreign-born. So people who have been born in another European countries than they live in um, currently at the moment. So study A, again, this only refers to... Um, to, to the longitudinal perspective, studying changes. And here I have 30 countries. At the upper level, at the uh, level two, country and years. Um, <clears throat> and at the individual level, um, the respondents. And what I found here distinguishing, again, as a quick reminder, I studied the level of economic inequality, presuming that this is, of course, important to um, look at to also see, do I find the exactly the same findings as has been found earlier? But then bringing in the state redistribution, um, the effect, the size of the, the redistributive capacity, as well as also controlling for the GDP in the end. And when I look at the results, well, they are not highly significant, right? only on a 10% level, but the effects go into the direction of the institutional hypothesis, right? Saying the higher the level of state intervention in, as a redistributive capacity, the higher the preferences for redistribution. And I find this effect at the between level, like the third level, as well as the um, second level when it comes to looking at changes across time, like within countries across time. Study B, again as a reminder, studying the foreign-born. And here we have the country of residence at the third level. At the second level, I place the foreign-born communities, right? Um, uh, so particular groups of foreign-born living, again, in the country of residence. So as an example, Germany as the country of residence and having then clustered together uh, Turkish uh, foreign-born 
uh, uh, Italian foreign born, Spanish foreign born, and so on. And again, at the individual levels, only looking here at the foreign born. And what is quite interesting here is that the effects are more significant and they actually also support um, the suspicion that institutions matter, that the state redistribution or the capacity here at the between level, the country of residence has a positive impact. So the higher, again, the redistributive um, effect at the in the country of residence, not effect the size, the country of residence, the higher the demand for redistribution. At the within level, um, I do see, and this is now the interesting part as well, that it does matter what kind of background I have, where I was born and what experience I have. So here the effect goes in this direction. I think it's um, easier to, to follow this kind of reasoning is that the lower the redistributive capacity in the country of origin, right, the lower the preference for redistribution, right? Or the higher the redistributive um, capacity in the country of origin compared to the country of residence, the higher the preference for redistribution. So this is basically just summarizing it up and um, uh, as a statement, this might be evidence, first evidence, but not really, right? Because we don't have yet uh, these uh, great institutional indicators that we are looking for and that we have to collect first before we use it in these um, empirical analysis. But it might uh, indicate, again, uh, that there is something going on like, and that we can presume or conceptualize as this institutionally generated norms um, when it comes to to inequalities in social security. So I want to end on this note. There's much more to come, hopefully in the future, uh, to disentangle this link. And now I presume that you're as tired as we were when we had our first kickoff meeting uh, uh, at a late a Friday afternoon. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your comments. OK. Time for questions we, from the audience. Yes. Remember, I, I don't have four eyes, so I'll be looking at your hands and try to keep the order. And I will kindly ask you that you only ask one or two questions, not three or four, like the last time, for the sake of keeping the conversation dynamic and for everyone to have a chance. So who is the first, who has the first hand up? OK, good. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, very brief question, just at the ver the last results you were showing, uh, is it that, are you certain that it's that the lower redistribution in the country of origin influences, or is it the, the, the quantity of change between how low the re redistribution was in the country of origin and how high it is in the new country? That's it. Yes, you're right. I'm looking at the at the difference, like at the at the relation. Yeah, yeah, yes. Not only that there is change, but actually that it's uh, quantifiable. Um, hi, hi, Simone. Um, thank you, thank you for sharing with us your project. It's really, really interesting and really, uh, I think it's it, it's path breaking. Breaking. Um, I have a question, uh, trying to understand a bit um, your norms generating uh, mechanism. Um, the policy feedback literature kind of um, plays lots of emphasis on, on the target groups, right? So, um, you know, uh, do people benefit from, uh, from policies that enable uh, greater distributions and so on? It doesn't seem to feature that much in your framework. It's, it's more of a socialization norms. But I was wondering a bit if you can tell us a bit more about uh, how these norms are generated. Uh, how is it that institutions generate these norms, particularly having in mind that people may not be very sophisticated about, you know, the nitty gritty of policies and institutions. So uh, um, how is this working in practice? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alina. And uh, yeah, great question. 
I hope to give you a more straightforward answer at the end of this project, but you're totally right. Um, there are different mechanisms, we presume, that are here at play when it comes to these, these norms and um, norm-generating processes. First, to the last point um, on whether individuals need information and detailed information. And as you've seen here, and this is why I was so puzzled by the fact that we, when we only take uh, the, the public spending on healthcare, that we already see here an effect. I mean, across countries, right, comparing countries, um, but also between groups within society. So apparently, um, individuals do not have to have exact information on the institutional frameworks. It doesn't have, um, it's not translated by the exact information. At least that's what we presume. Can go by other channels. And um, there are different processes, I think, that come into play. Again, of course, that depends on what we are looking at, at, a, at, at the outcomes when it comes to studying particular concepts of, of perceptions. But of course, it's also identity creating uh, processes that we presume are at play. Yeah? Um, how we perceive ourselves, how we perceive others, and especially when it comes to the fragmentation of the system, that this shapes our identity. Yeah? Think of, here in, in more global terms, of civil servants, right? um, uh, self-employed, um, but also between different individuals or occupation groups within the system that uh, receive um, a kind of privileges um, on the side from the system. Um, when it comes to studying particular uh, um, uh, perceptions related to outcomes, um, outcomes are always related to, to comparison processes, right? Drawing also from relative deprivation theory, but not only, of course, uh, equity theory. Um, I, we actually, this is my suspicion or hunch yet, is that principles, like our beliefs on principles, will be more de related to institutions, like generating norms on how how things should be redistributed in society, then uh, particular outcomes, right? But this is just a hunch, I don't know. I, I, I don't have empirical um, evidence here. But what your question mainly highlights is the fact that and this is what we try to do, to establish an inclusive theoretical framework that distinguishes by what we want to explain, but also that draws from the different theories. Institution, Neo-institutional theory basically just claims Institutions endow meaning, they establish norms, right? They influence us by being socialized in a particular thing, system, right? Um, but of course, there is much more to that. Um, yeah, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Simone, for, for your presentation. It was so thought provoking and really interesting and systematizing. I actually have two questions, not three, not four, but two, if I may. Uh, both of them, uh, okay, uh, both of them uh, regarding the subject of inequality and uh, perception of inequality. So, uh, you depicted this quite vividly and uh, convincingly that uh, there is some association between individual level uh, characteristics and individual level perception of inequality. But uh, I'm wondering when it comes to uh, cross-country comparison and institutional s settings, so what would you, uh, which type of institutional settings or which particular welfare domain you will identify as the key in moderating this association at the individual level? I mean, health care, pension system, education, whatever, uh, or some particular set of institutional arrangements, uh, what would be the main in moderating this association? And the second fact, uh, do you believe there are some cross-sectional uh, interrelations uh, across different welfare state domains and uh, perception of inequality within these domains. I mean, like, uh, do you believe it could be the case that uh, some capacity in uh, institutional organi ca certification capacity in uh, pension system 
uh, would somehow relate to perceived inequality in, uh, for example, healthcare or uh, a perception of fairness of uh, health inequality that you're citing much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much um, for, for this question. Um, with regard to, to the dimensions or the policy fields that we are focusing in, as I said, it's pension, healthcare, unemployment, minimum protection, many focusing on the, on, on the traditional uh, protection fields. We're not going into the social investment pr perspective or we're not focusing on childcare or parental leave um, patterns. Would they be also be important to study? Certainly, right? It's not uh, uh, that, that the one is more important than the other. However, we concentrate now on, the, um, on, the, on these traditional fields because it is important to study these. Like, without, without having social protection, um, uh, we don't have to look in social investment, uh, maybe. Uh, there are also other reasons for that. Um, for example, when it comes to educational systems, and I didn't have enough time to also show another study where we take a, a already an indicator for educational tracking, for example, that measures um, uh, uh, inequalities in the institutional design of education system, and that this has an effect also on, on perceptions. Um, so there are indicators out there, especially for, for education that I find very useful already, so we don't have to create them ourselves. Um, but anyhow, um, I, f to your question, I I think all of them are, are important. Um, it's an empirical question, what is more important? I don't know. However, I know already now that these institutional differences between pension and healthcare do not match or do not go along one-to-one. -one. That's why we basically have to create dimension-specific indicators right, um, for pension as well as healthcare. Um, and when we have this legal information, and hopefully also um, uh, quantify this, we of course can set them aside also statistical measures, right, uh, on, on expenditure as well as demographic measures, um, and come up with these, with these indicators that can be differently combined in the end. Um, but yes, it's, it's more an empirical question, and I, I, I don't know what I find it, but thanks. I'll ask a question and then I think Joste can ask his. Um, it's so nice to see a project that links the institutional and the individual with real perceptions of not just the individual's own context, but his or her perceptions of the institution. So uh, congratulations. I know you're still in the process of analyzing some of the data, uh, collecting some of the data. I wanted to ask you if you already have some um, findings and. Some of the findings you presented seem to indicate that, that you do of how um, individuals precisely at the lower levels of economic, uh, you know, the most disadvantaged individuals tend to be the ones who justify the system the most. You know, system justification theory, dissonance reduction, because they cannot change the system, they buy into the system because otherwise they are very anxious and unhappy. Of course, that doesn't apply to everyone, but you know, social psychological theory would say that that is the paradox. Do you have any sense that you are finding? I mean, some of the findings seem to indicate that they do. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> thank, thank you, Veronica. Um, uh, not really. Not really, and I'm not a big fan of the system justification theory, at least when it comes to, to looking at the empirics. I, I'm a big fan of the theory itself. Mm -hmm. um, however, at least in my findings, um, I, it happened to show that there are differences, but that they will not legitimize the thought of the lower ones are the ones who justify the system. Mm -hmm. However, and that said, when you look at this, um, this graph, you do see that there are systematic differences in the perceptions and that those lower down at the mm. bottom perceive less inequalities yes. in society. Yeah, yeah. right? Systematic justification theory would predict that. Ex yes, um, they would also go in the, uh, that they really, sh that it's not only a perception, but also um, 
a legitimation in a form that preferences should also be shaped like that. And when you look here at the graph at the lower income groups, you see that the gap for the lower income groups is higher. So they perceive a higher gap between what they, what they, what they perceive as actual earnings gap and as a legitimate earnings gap. And this discrepancy is larger than uh, for, for higher income groups, right? So this would go against system justification, yeah? But um, what is important, and I think I would love to do more research also on that, maybe there is some money also left for experiments, and when it comes to, um, to, the, to anchoring effects, because that's in the room, Actually, that's the elephant in the room. Can can uh, individual at, at at lower or coming from a lower economic background differentiate um, between the different dimensions um, uh, more more accurately? Right? Um, where do they put their anchor? Um, yeah. Out of battery. Okay. People, high levels of income have more information about what people in medium and low levels make. Uh, so some of that could also influence why peop more disadvantaged individuals are perceiving lo um, less of a gap because they just don't. They basically don't know what the CEOs of the companies, of the, you know, the managers of the companies they work for make, which is uh, yeah. And that, that's a very small point, but anyway, it just came to mind. Yeah. Definitely, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, information might be a point. Also, the, the discriminatory power or, or, or mental mindset. However, and when we look into, into the subjective social status rankings, we do see a shift towards the middle. Mm. So those higher at the income scale rank themselves lower yeah. as they should. And those that are, objectively speaking, lower at the, at the, uh, in the social hierarchy group themselves higher yeah. as a general tendency, yeah. which would actually bring to mind that those also high up don't know what those really at the bottom okay. have. You're right, sometimes they don't. They, yeah. And at the Often same time, yeah. it lets us assume that they are, however, well aware that there are people much higher up the ladder, so that's why they kind of, uh, yeah. that there's a downward shift. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, there's a lot of endogeneity going on in your models. And if I got it right, you're using the immigrants as a source of exogenous variation. And I'm, I'm a little bit doubtful whether that's a genuine solution, given that the migration pattern, the mix of migrants, et cetera, is endogenously uh, very much dictated by the nature of the country uh, to which the migrants flow. So uh, I'm not sure that the migrant uh, variable is actually introducing effective exogenous variation. Yeah, short answer to that, uh, you might be very right. <laughs> you might be very right. Um, and it, the problem becomes even more severe if we would assume that migrants would migrate, enter the country because of the social security system, right? Or because this, this country, which is actually, uh, uh, conforms more to their values that they have initially formed. However, and when we look into, um, I think there is a, a graph that I just didn't show out of for time reasons. Is it here? No. Uh, bam, bam. <laughs> Yes, this is a descriptive path or a graph that shows, uh, compares the different migrant groups um, according to the length of time in the country of residence with the natives, right? And what we see here is that they are different at the beginning, in the first five years when they enter a country in their preference for redistribution, right? And then they adjust or adapt 
to the native population. This is actually a finding that we also find, uh, or that I found with regard to health research, that others find who study political trust in institutions. Um, we also see the, the normal pattern uh, between high and low economic inequality in uh, the, the countries as such. Um, what would be your solution, Yossa, to the problem? <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> Would there be a solution to that, right? Um, it's, uh, with foreign-born, it's not perfect, but at least we can circle in and test, make, make an empirical test on whether there is a difference, right? What I have to, uh, I mean, um, there are more problems related to this kind of design Right, and also to the perks behind these analyses. I have to say that right now, and I didn't have time uh, before that. I mean, uh, when it comes to measuring the institutional context, I don't, when I refer to the country of residence, to the time that they have been born in that country, right? But rather the time of now, yeah? So, but even using that indicator, I do find effects. But there's certainly much more to do in the refinement of the measures. Um, however, these were only just first results. Sorry that they haven't been convincing. <laughs> Thank you very much again. Fascinating project. Um, I was wondering what's the role of uh, rational self-interest as a potential competing mechanism. No? So you're telling us that you know, you're, you're, you're providing a very innovative sort of like norm generation socialization mechanism, but you know, the policy feedback literature and political science sometimes tells us, well, sometimes people prefer something that they can actually get given the institutional setting. No? So I was wondering whether, um, you know, whether um, it would be a, a, a potential way forward to maybe uh, look at cohorts that are socialized for longer in, a, in, in that norm generation system. And if the sort of socialization mechanism you're telling us about is, is the main one, perhaps that should drive most of the effect compared to differences between income groups, no? That would be a more classical, rational self-interest kind of mechanism. Anyways, any thought about these two competing ideas? And then the second very quick comment, I was wondering whether you could exploit, um, so following up on this endogeneity discussion you guys were having, um, short-term versus long-term changes in redistributive or uh, designs, no? So for example, I'm thinking of um, child benefit policy in the UK. Uh, that has moved from universalistic to means-tested, and I think vice versa again, and vice versa again, even if this was happening within a very canonical Anglo-Saxon, you know, redistributive system. So if the socialization argument you're presenting is true, preferences should be actually quite resilient uh, to those changes, no? But if not, I was wondering whether these specific policy changes should generate more preference uh, formation uh, in, in, some, in some other way. Anyways, a couple of thoughts there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergey, for, for these excellent questions. Um, uh, yeah, certainly. Um, uh, actually, I believe, and this is what the project is built on, is that there are when there is a change, we should hopefully also observe another change. At least that's what we would assume. It's hopefully is the wrong word here, but that's what we would assume um, if we think that institutions shape our our not only perceptions but especially also our preferences, right? Just a, a, a quick graph, this was, um, is also on the preferences for redistribution by income. I mean, this is the standard graph. I just, I didn't show it. Um, this was to test whether the gen, but I also find what has been generally um, found in the literature is that of course self-interest uh, matters, right? Higher income groups show a less preference for, for redistribution uh, high income groups show less uh, preference for redistribution than low income groups. Um, yes, and this is, however, and this is important here to note, again, um, uh, we see that consistently for low as well as uh, high on, higher on like countries but lower or higher um, inequalities, right? And we do see the gap here as well, right? Um, that, so the context matters. 
as well as, of course, uh, the the individual income. Um, I did control here, of course, when I look into migrants. I mean, this is just a descriptive uh, graph, right? Um, but, of course, in the analysis, I control for income for all the standard uh, demographics. Um, to, to, to be clear on... Uh, and how far uh, this uh, adaptation effect is um, uh, actually independent of, of, of income. Um, but of course, here, of course income matters, right? It showed the, exactly what I showed before. Um, and still we see the adaptation effect. Um, I didn't highlight that, but this is um, what you basically see, see up, up here, right? The migrant and the length of time. Right, so the the longer the migrant is in the country or the foreign born, the more or the higher they are likely to prefer redistribution. Um, will be interesting though to, of course, understand uh, maybe if those longer in the country are also more rich, right? However, um, and that if there's some kind of a potential also, not only for cohorts, but uh, maybe also through survey rounds, that there's an interaction. I only included the, the year, but uh, I didn't yet check whether this is changing this pattern in some, to some degree. But uh, thank you very much. Uh, interesting question. Jorge, do you mind looking to see if there's anyone attending from home who has a question? And also, OK, we have one hand. Master students, you're very welcome here. Don't be shy. Ask questions if you have them, just like you were doing class. Uh, you have a hand, right? Thank you. Um, and I echo everyone's uh, comments on how interesting and thought-provoking it was. I think I have a one question um, regarding the, the graph that you showed on like the convergence between immigrants and native and the mechanism that you're proposing specifically. Because and this is, I think, actually related to the wording of Jordi's question, which was, can you put that, uh, the, the, the graph where you show kind of like the convergence? So my take, and maybe I'm not understanding this correctly, but my take on that graph is that there could be one of two things happening, and I want to know if you have, because I understood your, your talk to be about an institutional, basically what's going on there, if I understood your argument correctly, is that immigrants arrive into a new country, and because of the redistributional uh, institu redistributive institutions that, that are in this country, they start shaping their preferences, right? But this could also be just like they socialize more with natives, and natives have preferences for distributions, and that, is there like, an imp is, is there like a theoretical reason why we would think that one is happening o over the other? Do you think that both of those are in tandem? Does that make sense? Like, is this about hanging out more with the natives, or is this about seeing how institutions work, I guess would be my question. Um, well, actually, we would have an, uh, a problem if, as I said, the, the, the institutions would pull migrants, right? Or that migrants would move into a country that are more performing to, uh, more in, in, in line with their preferences. But actually, I would say uh, uh, my argument goes against this because we do see an adaptation effect. So it's not um, uh, related. But uh, again, I can't I can't show that. What it, this graph doesn't show, and what I haven't tested here, is in how far the institutional effect is basically uh, mixed with the length of time in the country. This is not what I'm I have tested so far. Right, in how far, for example, the institution of the country of residence is becoming stronger over time. I haven't tested that. So an interaction effect between the length of time as well as the institution. Um, but it will be certainly interesting to, to test that. Um, but I'm not sure in how far I, uh, so, I uh, understood you No, correctly. so very specifically, my question is, OK, so immigrants move into a country, right? Why is it that they are adapting their preferences? Is it because they look at the country and see like, oh my God, you know, like, I'm in Spain, like I can see that there's sort of like, you know, universal healthcare, so I like that better? Or is it because I hang out more with my peers and they're like, oh my God, you know what's mm -hmm. great, universal health, mm -hmm. like what's going on? Because in one instance it's institutions, but in the other one it's not, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, in the literature it's discussed that they adapt 
right, in the preferences, um, as well as in their other perceptions on trust and whatsoever. Of course, also because they mingle with with the with the, the natives. Often, this is referred actually as an indicator of assimilation and adaptation. Right, it's used as such to measure in how far people adapt, and we see that they do also in their preferences and perceptions. Um, What I didn't find, and this is important also when thinking back on my health care paper, which is already published and where I looked at this effect, is that the institutional effect has a different power from the time that they came in and at a later point in time, right? So it's not necessarily the institutions to answer your, uh, that they are getting stronger. Or, um, however, what also, what the literature um, mentioned, of course, with regard to healthcare, and it might be like a field-specific finding here, is that, uh, of course, the, the experiences with the system and the information of the system uh, matters, right? Um, but this is, again, uh, uh, Morgan's perspective and, and when we look at migrants and healthcare, a lot of other issues come apparent, right? Here it's simply the redistribution. But thanks a lot. This is an interesting question when it comes to the interaction. No? Um, thanks so much. Uh, can you hear me through this? Yeah. Um, thanks so much. Very cool stuff. Um, I love the macro micro work. I really, I buy the story. Um, I guess just out of curiosity, if we wanted to include something like ideology or broad political commitments, worldview, where would that fall within this framework? Is it just the sum of these individual preferences that you're using as outcomes? Or is it on another plane operating as a moderator of some sorts? Like, where would you just intuitively put that? Intuitively? Um they, they are, of course, part of the picture, right? We all have our worldviews, uh, belief systems. That's what I try to picture with this uh, with this graph, with the different components, because belief systems are supposedly our cognitive scripts, right? That serve us as the mental maps to assess, to perceive, to to prefer um, uh, particular aspects of the of the coin. And what I try to highlight with the with the poverty attributions, of course, this is just one. Uh, example of it is that uh, people can have, and this is important, I think I didn't highlight that, um, can can prefer contrasting or contradictory belief patterns or can hold them simultaneously, right? Referring to split consciousness theory, for example, right? Um, so, and this is where it becomes very interesting. So in Western societies, we are attached to meritocracy Right, or liberal worldviews, but at the same time, we can also hold opposing worldviews, right? And yes, I do believe that they have an impact on more specific um, outcome variables and that we always have to control for them, yeah? Thanks. Do we have any other questions for Simone before we close the session? Yes, Eva. Hi, sorry, I, I guess it's a sort of the same question as the beginning, but in the in reverse. Um, because I'm still confused as to the absolute versus the relative difference mm -hmm. of the origin country and the and the and the new country, right? The the host country. So I'm wondering whether you found the same when they go in reverse, right? So if somebody who comes from a very redistributive country who moves to a less redistributive country, um, yeah, be, I guess, sorry, it, it may be because of the way you explained it that it has to do with how low the distribution was in their origin country. That to me is an absolute um, judgment as opposed to a relative one. And so if it's relative, well, either way, I guess, but yeah, I think you're understanding my question mm -hmm. better than I'm asking it. Thank you. Is it on? Yeah. Um, yes, it's, it's certainly uh, 
relative. It's always in comparison. It's meant to be in, in comparison to the country where they live in currently. And I have this as an indicator here at the between level. And then uh, at, the, at the, yeah, between level, first level, um, country level. Uh, and uh, so comparing countries of residence with each other. And then I also suppose that groups within these countries, depending on where they come from and taking a relative measure because I want to put the two into relation, right? Because I have different groups of people in these, on, on this midterm. So yes, when it comes to the interpretation, you're totally right, it was my fault of not phrasing it uh, correctly, is that uh, the, the lower the redistributive power in the country of origin compared to the country of residence, yeah? Um, the lower the preference for redistribution, yeah? Termed differently, the higher the redistributive power in the country of origin compared to the country of rare origin, um, the higher the preference for redistribution. Controlling at the individual level for the length of time the migrant has been living in the country of residence. Yeah, what I don't know, and I have to highlight that I don't know when they left the country of origin um, and whether they have settled somewhere else in between. I don't know. I just know how long they have been living in the country of residence. What I try to, and this is what I showed here without mentioning it, I try to exclude individuals that have entered the country of residence before the age of, eight, age of 18, just to make sure, following the assumption, that they have experienced uh, another institutional system, assuming that they have not experienced too many systems in between, right? That they were born in one country and then, because I only have information where they have been born, as well as where they are living now and for how long they are living now. But yes, you're absolutely right, it's the relative that comes in here. However, I will run more models on that also to simply um, integrate, for example, the two levels. But the, the more indicators I integrate at the, at the lower levels, and I do have to control for also the actual income inequality as well as the GDP, right, the more tricky it gets um, uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, degrees of freedom, yeah. Thank you. Well. Thank you so much, Simone, for a very, very stimulating presentation. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I close the session. And we'll see Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.